Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Over the course of the next several videos, we're going to be talking extensively about cardiopulmonary pharmacology. One of the drugs that we're going to see is what's called warfarin, also called Coumadin. Warfarin is used as a blood thinner. So if somebody is at risk for blood clots, which could potentially lead to stroke, so stroke risk patients, they may be prescribed warfarin. And so warfarin lowers the risk of heart attack and stroke by preventing blood from clotting. Now, what allows blood to clot? Well, we need these proteins that are called clotting factors. So we're gonna come over here on the figure for just a minute. Now, clotting factors are proteins that are made and released into the blood by the liver, so they're always circulating in your blood, but they're released by the liver into the blood in an inactive form, okay? So they're inactive, and then whenever there's an injury, theoretically, the clotting factors should become active. Now, right here, we know the clotting factors are inactive because all that's designated is a Roman numeral that defines which clotting factor we're talking about. Down here, when we have the subscript A, the A means active, and so we know here that the clotting factors are in their active form, and of course they can convert prothrombin to thrombin and so on and so forth, and we get blood clotting. But these clotting factors right here, which are actually 2, 7, 9, and 10, are very important because they're what we call vitamin K dependent clotting factors. This is because in order for these clotting factors to even have the chance to become active, it requires vitamin K. Now, vitamin K is what we call an essential vitamin. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, but it's essential, meaning that as human beings, we do not possess the enzymes necessary to make it from scratch. And so we have to get it through the diet to have sufficient amounts. Okay? And when we intake vitamin K, we intake it in an immature form. So we consume some food that has vitamin K. It's in an immature form. It's, of course, taken in through the diet, absorbed into the blood, and ultimately goes to the liver, which is pretty handy because that's where these clotting factors are actually made in the liver. So let's actually talk about how this immature vitamin K is processed to this mature vitamin K, which then allows subsequent maturation of these four vitamin K dependent clotting factors. And to do that, we're gonna look at this little pathway right here, which is referred to as the vitamin K cycle. So right over here, this form of vitamin K, this is really what we term the immature vitamin K. So I'm actually gonna type that right there. Immature, too many M's. And this is actually the form of vitamin K that's intaken through the diet. Now, one quick thing about vitamin K is that it's really a class of compounds. So you see it has two basic components. It has this ringed network right here. We have these two rings, right? And then it has a tail with a varying number of carbon atoms in the tail. And so in general, all the vitamin Ks have the same basic bicyclic structure right here, but then the identity of the tail actually differs between the various vitamin Ks. So some of them will have more carbons, some might have more than one double bond, maybe all of these are double bonds. That's not the point, but there's various forms of vitamin K that we can use. So hopefully that makes sense. But in any case, when we have this form of it with these two ketones right here, Notice those are two carbonyls or two ketones. This is the immature form of vitamin K. We need to process it to this form up here, which is the mature form of vitamin K. And I'll talk about why it's mature in just a minute. Now the reaction that converts this form of vitamin K to its mature form is catalyzed by vitamin K quinone reductase. Now this enzyme can either use the reducing power of NADPH to perform the reduction, or it can use a couple of thiol functional groups that are found within the enzyme. And when that happens, of course, NADPH is converted to NADP, or if we're using the thiols, uh, these reduced forms actually form a disulfide linkage and therefore become oxidized. But in the process, uh, this form actually becomes reduced. So sometimes the immature form will actually be termed the quinone form, and then the mature form up here will be referred to as the reduced form. Okay, We need vitamin K in the reduced form to perform this reaction over here. 
Now this reaction is the reaction that occurs on those clotting factors, numbers 2, 7, 9, and 10. Now within the protein structure of those clotting factors, there's amino acid residues. And if you look at this one, this is glutamate, right? That's just a functional group of glutamate. And so if you look down here, that gamma carbon of the glutamate residue now has an additional carboxyl group on it. And so it's no longer glutamate, it's actually termed gamma carboxy glutamate. And it's given this three-letter abbreviation GLA as opposed to GLU for glutamate. And several of the glutamate residues on those clotting factors absolutely have to be gamma carboxylated in order for those proteins to be functional. And so this reaction where we gamma carboxylate those clotting factors is catalyzed by this enzyme vitamin K dependent carboxylase. It's a vitamin K dependent enzyme because it actually uses this reduced form of vitamin K in order to perform the gamma carboxylation. What that means is that if we don't have vitamin K, meaning none of this dietary vitamin K, we're not going to have any of this reduced form of vitamin K, and therefore we're not going to be able to gamma carboxylate those proteins. And so that's the reason why those clotting factors are vitamin K dependent. It's because this enzyme that gamma carboxylates them is dependent on vitamin K. Now, once this reaction carboxylates those clotting factors, uh, this reduced form or mature form of vitamin K is transformed into an epoxide. You can see this epoxide functional group, and then this is reconverted back to the original form of vitamin K, the quinone structure, by this enzyme called vitamin K epoxide reductase. Again, it's gonna use the reducing power of either NADPH or these two thiol functional groups, in which case we get out NADP or a disulfide linkage between those sulfur atoms. And that gives us back our quinone form or immature form of vitamin K. Now if we look here in this red box, we see the chemical structure of the drug warfarin, also called Coumadin. And on the top right here, we see this bicyclic double ring structure. And from these two enzymes' perspectives, uh, this bicyclic structure resembles the bicyclic structure we see here of normal vitamin K. And so because of that, warfarin is able to get into the active sites of both of these enzymes and act as a competitive inhibitor. And so that way, the immature form or quinone form of vitamin K can't be converted to its mature reduced form. And any leftover epoxide form can't be reconverted back to uh, the quinone form right here. And so what that does is it depletes the amounts of this reduced vitamin K and therefore prevents these clotting factors from becoming carboxylated. Therefore, you don't have functional forms of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. And so coming back here, if you don't have mature vitamin K, you don't have mature forms of these clotting factors. Therefore, they can't become activated and therefore they cannot help with the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin and you can't clot blood. And that's how warfarin acts as a blood thinner. So before we conclude this video, an interesting note, before warfarin was used in humans to attempt to reduce stroke risk, it was actually used for rats. So people might have had rat infestations, most people don't want rats moving around their house and so forth. And so they would actually put on little treats, so to speak, for the rats. They'd put warfarin on it. And the amount of warfarin that the rats would consume is well beyond the amount that humans would consume relative to our size. So it's basically a toxic or lethal dose for the rat. And so the warfarin itself wouldn't kill the rat. What would happen is, is that the rat would just be doing everyday activities. And, you know, when you move, you might accidentally brush into something. And normally that wouldn't be a problem, but it would cause microscopic bleeding, and then the bleeding wouldn't stop. And so the more the rat bumps into things, the more it internally hemorrhages, bleeds, and eventually it bleeds out and dies uh, because it can't clot its blood. And then somebody said, well, you know what? If we gave this at a much lower dose for humans, uh, we might be able to thin the blood and reduce risk of stroke. And that's ultimately how warfarin came to be used as a drug to reduce stroke risk. So hopefully this video gave you some good information about the mechanism of warfarin and the vitamin K cycle and how that actually helps reduce the viscosity of the blood. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.